I was afforded the opportunity to debate Jehovah's Witnesses on live international television back in 2008. Or should I say they were afforded the opportunity to appear on the show with me? Nevertheless, let me tell you the story. Hey everyone, before we dive into today's video, I wanted to take a quick moment to tell you about something exciting. As many of you may have seen, the channel has launched a, a merch store called Cult Classic. It is a play on words, of course. We've all seen them, um, those iconic objects that become cult classics. From the sleek lines of a vintage muscle car to the minivan that awed you to countless soccer practices, the roller skates, the 80s-style boomboxes, and the vinyl records. These items hold a special place in our hearts. It's a great way to show your appreciation for the truly unique aspects of history, all while supporting the channel. And thank you very much to those who have bought items from the store. Um, I appreciate that. Now let's get back into the topic at hand. Imagine a religion that claims to hold the ultimate truth and direct line to God himself. Now picture them tiptoeing across a tightrope, desperately clinging to a narrative while simultaneously shying away from the very platform that could amplify their message. Jehovah's Witnesses are notorious for shying away from appearing in mainstream media or giving interviews. And the few times that they do is to defend themselves against their handling of CSA or to address attacks on their members as we have seen with the Kingdom of Blasts in India last year. However, when faced with an opportunity to talk about their faith and doctrines on a mainstream platform, they shy away from it. Moreover, there is an irony in their refusal. So back in 2008, just after the release of my second book, Cult How They Work, I received a call from the producer of the show called African Views at the South African Broadcasting Corporation. She wanted to know if I was the author of the two books, Losing the Faith and Cult, How They Work. I said, yes, I am. And she proceeded to say, look, we are preparing for an episode on fundamentalism in religion. And we would like to have you on the show as part of the panel. I said, sure, I would love to be part of the discussion. However, I'm based in Durban and your studios are in Johannesburg. She said, not to worry, we are going to do a live crossing uh, during the live show the following Tuesday. All you need to do is to get to the studios in Durban, uh, where we will do the crossing to you during the broadcast of the show. The following Tuesday, I head down there to the studios and we do the show. However, after the show, as I was walking to my car, my phone rang and I answered it. It was the host of the show thanking me for my contribution to the discussion but that is not the main reason for his call. He proceeded to say, Mr. Jackson, I think we just opened up a can of worms with the show. I'm going to send you the responses from viewers during the show, which include text messages and emails. He continues to say that they need to do a follow-up show, touching on this topic, but we will discuss the issue that of cults that I brought up, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, Scientology, etc., in the next show. However, he says, we want you in the studio for this one. So let me know when you are up in Johannesburg and we will schedule the show. Well, three weeks later, I happened to be scheduled for a business trip to Johannesburg. I contacted Uli, the host of the show, and told him that I would be in Johannesburg the following week. And I asked him if he was so interested in doing the show. He said, great. Yes, let's do it. So let me know when you are in Johannesburg and we can schedule a meeting. I did that and we met at the studios in Johannesburg uh, for a briefing. Over lunch, we discussed the format, etc. together with another guest who was a former cult member from Nigeria. When he said to me that he would reach out to the Jehovah's Witnesses to ask them to send a representative to the show because they would like to have a balanced perspective and hear the story from both sides. 
I said, by all means, reach out to them because I would love to debate them on live international television. But I said, they might refuse to be on a show with a known apostate. But the prospect of a live television debate thrilled me. The following day, Uri called me to tell me how the interaction went with the branch office in Krugersdorp on the outskirts of Johannesburg. The person that they spoke to on the telephone asked them what the show was about. The producer says the show will be about cults and high control groups. And your organization is labeled as one. But we would like to hear your side of the story and afford you the opportunity to defend yourselves and set the record straight. So the person on the other side of the call asks what type of questions will be asked or can be uh, expected and if they could send them a breakdown of the questions that will be covered. The producer replies, look, this is a discussion panel. There are no set questions. The line of discussion will vary as the panelists uh, give their opinions and views and the discussion uh, will flow from there. Then the person asks, who else will be on the show? So the producer answers, we will have a representative from Scientology uh, on the show, Ryan Hogarth, um, who subsequently left Scientology not long after the show. We will have a, an ex-cult member from Nigeria on the show, and we will have Robin Jackson, who is a former member of your organization on the discussion panel too. And that was when the invite was declined. However, we continued with the show and it received one of the highest ratings of all the episodes in the history of that show. The irony was as thick as the humidity in the turbulent South African summer. Here's a group claiming to possess absolute truth, the sole conduit to God, yet unwilling to defend their doctrines on a platform with the potential reach to reach countless souls. Weren't they the ones racing against the clock of Armageddon, desperately seeking converts? This aversion to open discourse extends beyond a single anecdote. Their multi-million dollar media center, a testament to their financial muscle, seems discordant with the supposed urgency of the approaching end times. It's a case of paradise delay, wouldn't you say? Even their JW Broadcasting Channel, a foray into television evangelism, lacks the most basic element of public engagement, a comment section. The reason, as we all know, is self-evident. Why are Jehovah's Witnesses so averse to public theological debates? One primary reason lies in their centralized top-down approach to information control. Unlike some denominations with open theological discussions, Jehovah's Witnesses adhere to a strictly defined set of doctrines disseminated solely through the Watchtower Society, their governing body. Public debates with their inherent spontaneity and potential for unforeseen uh, challenges could disrupt this carefully curated message. The Watchtower Society meticulously crafts all official pronouncements, ensuring a unified voice across its global membership. Debates with their unscriptural or unscripted nature could introduce the risk of contradictory statements or interpretations. This could sow confusion among members accustomed to receiving information through a single controlled channel. Furthermore, public debates often involve exposing and criti critiquing opposing viewpoints. Jehovah's Witnesses who view themselves as possessing the sole channel of God's truth might perceive debate as a form of legitimizing alternative perspectives. Engaging with critics in a public forum could be seen as acknowledging the validity of their arguments, a concession the Watchtower Society is unwilling to make. Another factor contributing to their media shyness is the potential for negative portrayals. Debates, particularly those on television, often rely on sound bites and condensed arguments. Complex theological points can be easily misrepresented or taken out of context in such a setting. The Watchtower Society likely fears negative media coverage that could paint them in an unfavorable light, potentially deterring potential converts. 
Moreover, Jehovah's Witnesses prioritize spreading their message through a controlled environment. Their door-to-door ministry allows them to target individuals who may be receptive, directly address any questions, and control the flow of information. Debates, on the other hand, involve engaging with an unpredictable audience and potentially hostile interactors. This lack of control over the conversation is likely a significant deterrent. The organization's emphasis on shunning former members also plays a role. Public debates might involve ex jehovahs Witnesses offering critical perspectives on the religion. The Watchtower Society strictly discourages in any interaction with those who have been disfellowshipped. 